Good morning. My name is John Patrick. This is my wife, Asia. Um, we're going to be another married couple reading a Bible scripture today. And we're going to be reading from the spiciest book in the Bible, Songs of Solomon, um, chapter 8, verse 4 through 14. Yeah. All right, here we go. Promise me, O woman of Jer Jerusalem, not to awaken love until the time is right. Who is this sweeping in from the desert, leaning on her lover? I aroused you under the apple tree, where your mother gave you birth, where in great pain she delivered you. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as, as strong as death is jealousy, as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fly, fire, the brightest kind of flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. If a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, his offers would be utterly scorned. We have a little sister too young to have breasts. What would we do for our sister if someone tries to marry her? If she's a virgin like a wall, we will protect her with a silver tower. But if she's promiscuous like a swinging door, we will block her door with a cedar bar. I was a virgin like a wall. Now my breasts are like towers where my lover looks at me. When my lover looks at me, he is delighted with what he sees. Solomon has a vineyard at Belham, which he leases on to, sorry, which he leases out to tenant farmers. Each of them pays a thousand pieces of silver for harvesting its fruit. But my vineyard is mine to give, as Solomon need not to not pay a thousand pieces of silver, but I will give two thousand pieces to those who care for it, for its vines. Oh, my darling, lingering in the gardens, your companions are fortunate to hear your voice. Let me hear it too. <laughs> Come away, my love. Be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Thank you. Wow. That brother John said the spiciest book of the Bible, <laughs> but he's, he's not wrong. Uh, well, I want to make a quick beeline as you have your seat. It's good to see you. You guys look wonderful. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, I think our New Year's Eve watch night service the last time that I was here. Uh, man, really quickly, big shout out to your pastor, uh, Dr. Dio and his wife, Dupe. Love them to death. Um, it seems like Every time I'm here, uh, I've already had another kid, and, <laughs> but we're done. Amen. It uh, doesn't matter how tantalating that verse, those verses of Scripture are. Uh, my wife, and Mitchie, and I, she's over here. Our kids are here. We're definitely done. But in April, I think last time I was here, I mentioned how Dio was kind enough to come to our home during the early days of the pandemic to do our daughter's naming ceremony. And uh, he was kind enough, him and Dupe as well, um, back in, I guess, February to do uh, our newborn, our five-month-old Isaiah's name ceremony. So, you know, he has a special, special place in my heart, and you all have a special place in our hearts. Our, it's, it is interesting how many people in our church still talk about the uh, fellowship and the love and just the uh, environment that we share with you all at the end of the year last year. So uh, I am so encouraged, one, because of the great work you're doing. Uh, it, you know, we're, Dow and I, we're talking all the time. And, you know, sometimes you just need to be in other spaces to be reminded like you're doing a good work. And I want to remind you all, man, you're doing a fantastic work. And secondly, Typically, you know, when I'm out, you know, um, if I'm speaking in other places, and this is no knock on most churches, but oftentimes we're in such a rush to get through the service. You know, I see my clock is running like we were, we're trying to get through things. So songs are going quick, prayers are going quick. I was blown away by the fact that you all took intentional time to pause and pray for an extended period of time. 
that communicates to me, you realize that the power of this church won't be in the fact that you have a great leader, which you do. The power of this church won't be in the fact that you have amazing worship leaders, which you do, great community, which you do. You understand the power has to come from on high. Max Lucado once said that the, pow- the effectiveness of prayer is not so much in the one who is speaking, but the one who is listening. And you all understand that the one who's listening is mighty and he can move on our behalf. So praise God for you understanding that, Lord, if you don't move, ain't nothing going to happen. So yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'll, when we be before you long, uh, we <laughs> you already know what time it is. The, ser- the series is up there if you're new. This may be a bit of a shock, uh, but if you've been here for a couple weeks, then you already know you're in your Sex in the City series. And today we are closing out in Song of Solomon chapter 8, verses 4 through 14. Now, before we get there, and this may seem like a bit of a stretch, but um, if you've ever traveled to Orlando, Florida, most people, if they go and visit Orlando, typically they're going to Disney. You typically don't go to Orlando for any other reason as a family. But if you're a sneakerhead, which I am not, but I have a lot of friends who are. If you're a sneakerhead, then you're, if you land in Orlando, Florida, you're probably not trying to go see Walt Disney or get on rides. You're probably trying to go to the trophy room. The trophy room is the upper scale boutique uh, sneaker store run by the heir apparent, or at least one of the heir apparents to the Jordan throne, Marcus Jordan. He has curated this wonderful boutique store in Orlando where in the trophy room, it has game-worn sneakers. Many of you may have heard that Jordan's game-worn sneakers that he wore during his flu game just auctioned off for $1.3 million, which I'm like, you know, for some sneakers that the brother had his socks and sneaky feet in. But, you know, when you're the second best player in uh, NBA history, I guess that's what happens. Uh, And if... If you wonder why I say second, we can talk afterwards. The, the, the trophy room has game-worn sneakers. It has photos from the family, their childhood photos. It has um, pictures of Jordan and some of his greatest moments. It has signature shoes that is, they have partnered with Nike to put in the trophy room. The big thing about the trophy, it's a place, if you're a sneakerhead, if you're a Jordan head, if you're one of those people that will wait hours and hours to get a brand new pair of Jordans and then scrub them all day and all night and only wear them one time a year, if you're that kind of person, when you to the trophy room, that's the place you want to be. That's the place of enjoyment. That's the place where you get to viscerally feel and enjoy the, uh, like, just the, the joys of knowing, man, I'm, I, I'm in the trophy room. But if you know anything about the trophy room, you know that as great as it is to enjoy, as great as it is to see game-worn sneakers, memorabilia of Michael Jordan himself, as awesome as it is to see his son running the store, It's just a preview of the main, it's pointing to something greater. Because the real trophy room isn't in Orlando, it's actually in the Jordan residence. It's in their family's home where guests and dinner parties will be held there and people want to go in and see where his six championships are, to see where uh, his memorabilia are. The trophy room was the place in the center of the house where everyone wanted to be. If you go to Orlando, you're able to enjoy, but it's not the real thing. Today, as we come to the end of this Sex in the City uh, sermon series, it may seem like a big stretch to talk about Jordan 1's in the context of sex and marriage, but the idea here is that sex is something to be enjoyed in the context of marriage, but it's also pointing to a greater reality. It's pointing to something far greater, a longing that every soul has, whether single or married. And so for the brief time that I have with you today, as we talk about this subject of sex, our deepest longings, and what it ultimately points to. I want to really quickly walk you through three things. First, in verses 4 through 7, we will see the power of love. Secondly, in verses 8 through 12, the protection of love. And then finally, in verses 13 through 14, we see the promise of love, the power of love, the protection of love, And then finally, the promise of love. We begin in verse four. It says this, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved under the apple tree? I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal on your arm. For love is strong as death. 
Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man be offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. In a lot of ways, verses five through seven is the climax and the apex of the Song of Solomon. In the book of Song of Solomon, particularly in these final verses, in verses five through seven, it's referred to as what's known as the hymn of love. All throughout the book, it's been celebrating and it's been rejoicing in this loving union, this romantic intimacy, the sex in the context of the marriage relationship. As the book starts with the two lovers, as they are looking and desiring one another, right out the gate, verse, chapter one, verse two, the woman says that she longs to kiss him on the mouth. And you're like, okay, this is a different kind of book in the Bible. And as you keep going, you realize that they, they using very erotic language, they talk about their longing and their desire for one another. And then you fast forward and you keep going through the book and there's a little bit of trouble in paradise. But that doesn't last long as the couple is able to come together, as they are able to experience marriage together and the joys of it. And now at the end of Song of Solomon, they are rejoicing and they are really exclaiming the fact that their love song has many benefits and their union has the potency of the love that they share with one another. But verse four is the refrain of the song that has now occurred three times. In chapter two, verse seven, chapter three, verse five, and now here in chapter eight, verse four, we see that continual admission, that charge to the daughters of Jerusalem that they quote, not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. It's the charge to keep themselves sexually pure until their wedding day. Whenever God repeats himself, says something over and over again, it's not because he just likes to hear himself speak and it's not because he has a speech impediment. It's because he has something that we really need to hear and take heed to. In the world that you and I live in, verse four often sounds like, okay, let me just roll my eyes. Even though it echoes everything the Bible says about sex in the context of marriage and oneness, typically people roll their eyes and they say, man, you know, that's outdated. That's old school. That's antiquated. It's 2023. I mean, I have needs. And oftentimes, even those who would consider themselves Christ followers find themselves thinking the same thing. And we live in a culture where everywhere you look, uh, sex is supercharged, it's overly sexualized in uh, TV, on your eye, it's all over the place. And oftentimes I hear people say this, um, I'll, why do I need to wait until I'm married? It's just sex. Listen, if you don't hear anything else I have to say today, hear this, it is never just sex. Ian Duguid in his commentary on the Song of Solomon has a really great take on it. He says, after saying sex is never just sex, he says, we may use sex to find security. If I have sex with my boyfriend, then he'll want to marry me. Or we'll use sex to find significance. If I can find a girl who wants to sleep with me, I will feel attractive. Or we'll use sex for intimacy. Sex will move our relationship to a whole new level. Or we seek fake security, fake significance, and fake intimacy through what he calls solo sex or pornography. Even if you've done just a cursory look and a glance through the Song of Solomon, even if you haven't been here for all four weeks, you've maybe been in one or you've heard passages read in Song of Solomon, then you understand that the way that sex is talked about here, it's not like it's some here today, gone tomorrow commodity like milk, cheese, or toilet paper. That it is something that is treasured. It is something that is valuable that in the context between a husband and a wife, it's a place where they are both fully known and fully accepted. It's the intersection between vulnerability, love, passion and desire. It's a glorious experience because God himself is the architect and the designer of sex. It's his idea, which means he gets to set the blueprint and he sets the context for which it best flourishes, which is in marriage as he designed. What ends up happening when you take the designer and the creator's blueprint and you say, uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm a bust a hole in that wall. I'm gonna jerry-rig some stuff. What ends up happening is what we see a lot in our culture right now, sexual chaos. Sexual chaos. There are a number of reasons, but for the sake of time, I'll just share with you one. You know, when a husband and wife, when they get married, typically at their vows, at the end of their vows, they'll say something along these lines, um, until death do us part. What they're communicating is, we're communicating commitment to one another. We're committed to go the distance with one another. We still need the Lord's help even to do that, 
but that's what we're signing up for. But when you decide to, in the words of the song Solomon, awaken love before it pleases, you're essentially playing blackjack with your life. Why, why do I say that? Well, because it's not just your sex life you're playing with, it's your whole life. As you give yourself over to someone who hasn't committed themselves to you for the long haul. Dean and Sarah in his recently released book uh, titled uh, Pure, subtitled um, The Bible's Plan, Why the Bible's Plan for Sexuality Isn't Outdated, Irrelevant, or Repressive. He says this, God doesn't want us doing permanent things with temporary people. That's a bar, so I'm going to run it back. God doesn't want us doing permanent things with temporary people. Why? Because when you are doing something that is permanent with someone that is temporary, but you give them access to something that is very permanent and something that's very precious, as they exit your life as quickly as often they came into it, you're left often feeling robbed. You're left often feeling used. And not to mention the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual roller coaster you'll inevitably travel on. And you realize it's not just sex. You know, one of the things I love about your pastor is that he's not afraid of the smoke. What do I mean by that? He said, we're going to do a whole... Se- Listen, the, we, no, regardless of how uncomfortable you may feel about a sermon on sex and sexuality this morning, I know one thing for sure. At 1030, I'm going back to the house and then... Next week, I'm back at the West Church going through the Gospel of Mark. But he got to come back and keep dealing with this stuff. So it, it, he's unafraid. Cause, and what I love about that is because he understands this is one of the most sensitive and the most important topics, not just in the life of the church, but in the life of every human being. And oftentimes, the Song of Solomon is the one book in the Bible people do not touch. They say, just figure it out on your own. Or you just experience things and then try to figure out, okay, what does sex and sexuality look like? And what I love about, especially the last couple of months here at King City, is that Dial said, man, we're going for all the idols. We're going to do money. I know you guys did a series on money towards the end of last year, right before Advent. Uh, He said, we're going to go for the two biggest idols in the lives of people in the world, money and sex. What do I, the thing I love about that, and stay with me, I'm going somewhere. When the Bible talks about money, it's this idea that it doesn't belong to you, it all belongs to God, you're a steward, not an owner, and that not only do you use it to take care of yourself, your family, plan for your future, invest, all that, Proverbs talks a bunch about that, but the idea of, genera- of money is that you're open-handed with it, meaning you're extremely generous. The Bible's talk about sex is that it's something precious in the context of the marriage union, that is something that is a joy to experience, <clears throat> but it's something that you are guarded with. We live in a culture where people don't say, oh, I'm generous with my money, but guarded with my sex life. We live in a culture where people say, we're just gonna mix the two. I'm gonna be really generous with my sex life, so any Tom, Dick, and Harry can have access to it, but I'm gonna be real stingy with my money. You see the problem with that? When you're just willy-nilly with your sex life, where you're openly generous with it, the issue ends up being, you're resulting in much chaos, heartbreak, sexual chaos, and really, frankly, a lot of confusion. And the, you know, the funny thing about idols, like the devil, they promise a lot on the front end, but they never follow through on the back end. So you say, okay, I want, you know, if we sleep together, maybe he'll want to marry me one day. And the words of Beyonce, if that brother don't put a ring on it, then you ain't got no real, like, permanent thing to go off of. Or you say, well, as the commentator said, well, maybe this is the way that he'll see how much I really love him. <laughs> when the, the Bible's understanding of love includes sacrifice. It, so it, it, it always promises a lot on the front end, but it never can follow through on the back end. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, man, I, I, if, you're, if I'm honest, I probably awoke in love one, two, three, four, five, more times than I could count. Is there any hope for me? And the Bible will say, Absolutely. Absolutely. In the gospel, there's always hope. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. This is, this is incredible to me. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, he just starts listening to stuff. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, mm, idolaters, or uh, idolaters or adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then here's the great part. He says, and such were some of you. So he says, oh, yeah, I know. And if you know anything about the book of 1 Corinthians, it's essentially the church just gone wild. He says, and such were some of you. So he's talking to the church saying, I know y'all been out in them streets. Then listen to what he says. But you were washed, past tense. You were sanctified. 
you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our spirit of God. Paul is saying that even if you feel, even if you resonate with the words of the Irish writer, uh, John Bainville, when he says the past beats inside of me almost like a second heart, it's still no match for the justifying, sanctifying, powerful cleansing of Christ in the gospel. The truest thing about you is not your past sexual history or what you've done. It's about what the Lord Jesus has done for you on the cross. And when that, and, and this is an interesting thing because it's like when that becomes your reality by faith, regardless of what your past may have looked like or your present may feel like, Jesus is always pointing you, look at my righteousness and look at my purity. That it, it, it's a gift that I give. Or let me put it another way. Your sin nor mine is any match for the powerful love of God in Christ. And that's exactly the point he's trying to make here in verses five through seven. After the couple spotted embracing one another, and it says that the wife is leaning on her beloved, this public display of mutual dependence and love. Uh, and then it says, uh, they, she awakened her beloved under the apple tree. If you've been here, you know, awaken is using sexual language and more erotic language. But now it's not just their desire for one another because he said, she ends up saying to her beloved that this is where he was born and where uh, her, his mother bordered, not the fact that they were literally having sex under the apple tree. The point that he's trying to make is that uh, part of the blessing of marriage and sex in that marriage is the fruitfulness of family and children. That it is a byproduct of that. But then finally, in verses six through seven, we see this powerful description of love. First, he said, set me, she says, set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm, both internal and external. If you know anything about seals in the Old Testament, seals were essentially the way you identify a possession, a sign of legal documents. A king would take a seal and he would put his signet ring on it to be able to say, this uh, law that I'm putting into decree, it's permanent. It's not changing. I got a friend, a bunch of friends of mine who end up after college, uh, you know, joining a fraternity in their grad chapter or whatever. And I have a, one of my friends, he's an Omega now. And, you know, he always, listen, everybody know he's an Omega now. I'm like, bro, it's, I mean, it, we've been out of school for like 15 years. But <laughs> anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But one of the things that they love to do, they love to get branded. You know, take his, now he's wearing shirts that's just cut off on the sleeve just, just because, just so we can see, just so we can see his seal. He's saying, uh, this, is, this is permanent. Ain't no turning back. The wife, the bride is saying to her husband, I, I want to be a permanent part of you. That our love, it's not just internal, but it's external. That it's not just in your heart, but it's public. And then she is, goes on to say, uh, essentially, till death do us part. The remaining verses are about how powerful this marital love is. First, it says it's strong. It's, it's as strong as death. Death is a tenacious foe. It's relentless. It doesn't typically lose battles. But this love, he says, she says, is as strong as death. It's as tenacious, as relentless, and it's not afraid of death. Then it says, it's as jealous, as fierce as the grave. Often when we think about jealousy, we think about something that's very negative. But in this context, it's positive, And it has the refrain from Zechariah and other books of the Bible where God talks about his uh, love being really jealous for us, himself being really jealous for his people in a very positive context. But then ultimately pointing to the fact that that jealousy means it's a desire for someone that has no rivals. Then it compares love to the flashes of fire. When fire is on a campground with wood burning, that's a good thing. When fire is in your living room carpet, that's a problem. Here, and essentially, that's more than a problem, that's a nightmare. It's all about the context and where it's located because something as powerful as fire has to be treated with care, caution, and safety. He says, love is no different. Love is no different. And what makes this love so powerful is its source. Since it's a divine love, the very flame of the Lord. This flame of love is so potent that he says an abundance of water cannot quench it. Water is normally what you use to quench out fires, but all the water from all the oceans of the world can't extinguish this flame of love. When you hear a love like this, you're thinking, how do I harness this? How can I get my hands on it? Philip Riken says, he asked the question, what should we be willing to pay for this kind of love? The answer, it doesn't matter because it's not for sale. He says, if a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, 
he would be utterly despised. Or to quote the 90s R&B group Blackstreet, money can't buy love. Because this kind of love, some of y'all had to go back, that was early 90s. <laughs> because this kind of love, it can't be bought with money, it has to be given freely. What is, this, this is the picture, this picture of love, it, the picture that he's trying to paint, that she's trying to paint, is that this love has gone 12 rounds in the ring. It's like Creed fighting Jonathan Major's character in the last Creed movie. It's going round for round. It, it's going against death, came out undefeated. It's going against the flames, it's came out undefeated. It's going against an avalanche, a tsunami of water, it's come out undefeated. It's going against everything and it's still left standing. Well, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he would say like this in verse 8, love never fails. This focus is on the marriage relationship, but it goes way beyond that as it points to the undefeated love of God in Christ for his people. Remember what Paul says in Romans 8, that great, really, uh, really the great proclamation of how much God loves you. He ends up saying somewhere around verse 38, he says, what should separate us from the love of God? Shall famine, shall sword, shall pestilence, shall things in the past, shall things, and, and then he ends up saying, no, N neither height nor death. He says, nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ, which means whether single or married, the aim of our lives is to be captured by this love and to capture this love for ourselves. Back in the day, MasterCard used to have these um, commercials where they would show a family, you know, it'll be like a big family reunion, and uh, it'll say, you know, four-year-old's dress, $20. Then it'll show the camera, say, DSLR, well, they probably had DSLR back then, but, you know, whatever the old school 20-year-old equivalent of the DSLR, they'll say $200. And then it will say, a family of four generations gathering together for the first time in years, priceless. You already know it. Paul, the Song of Solomon is saying, this love is priceless. It's priceless. You can't purchase it. It has to be given freely to you. But when you encounter a love this strong, the next thing you have to do, you have to protect it. Look at what he says in verses 8 through 12 as we move to our second point, the protection of love. It says, we have a little sister and she has no breast. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. If she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Himan. He let out vineyards to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit thousands of pieces of silver my vineyard, my very own, is before you, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand and the keepers of fruit, 200. Verses 8 through 12 is like clicking the next song on your Spotify playlist. Now, the song has moved to the others or the brothers saying, and they, they ask a question about their little sister. It says, uh, who will speak for her on the, day, uh, on the day she's spoken for? She has no breast. What the point is there, when it says on the day she's spoken for, it's speaking about her wedding day, when, when someone wants to marry her. And then when it says she has no breasts, it's speaking to the fact of that she is uh, not physically mature yet, not sexually mature yet, or hasn't reached puberty. And then they said, if she's like a wall, meaning she has kept herself sexually pure and chaste in, in, as in her virginity, it says that we will build on her battlemental silver, meaning we will support, we will rejoice, and we will uh, rejoice in the fact that she's kept herself pure until her wedding day. But then it says, but if she's a door, meaning she's sexually promiscuous, people come in and out, it says that in that case, we will build on her boards of silver. They're trying to, in some sense, protect her. She responds by saying, I am a wall, meaning I've kept myself sexually pure. I've guarded myself sexually. And she says, I'm mature because she said my breasts are like towers. And as a result, she's ready for her husband in whom she finds peace. She says that word peace there literally means wholeness and shalom. These verses alert us to the importance of the protection of love. Regardless of all the different kind of language and people kind of disagree on who's talking and, and what's really being indicated, one thing's for certain, that they want to protect the purity, they want to protect the sexual nature of their little sister. 
And she ends up saying, oh, I've already done the job. But the point that they're trying to make is that, um, when, and I think that is really important for us to understand is that one of the things we learned from this is that the protection of love is not a solo sport. It's not a solo endeavor, excuse me, it's a team sport. You know, oftentimes people will want to have their sex life be a very private thing. No, no, nobody, you know, I don't want to tell anybody who I'm dating, who I'm talking to, or what's going on in my marriage. And the idea that the Song of Solomon here has is that, well, um, that's where you get into a lot of issues. When, I don't know if you've ever had this situation, but when I have friends who, you know, I thought we were cool. I thought we were really close. I thought we talk all the time. And then I find out nine months later, oh, you've been dating somebody, and then all of a sudden you post, y'all getting engaged. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. We don't even, who is this? We, and then you want me to buy the fabric? I'm like, hold on, time out. You, you, you want me to pay money to go to your trad for somebody I don't even, and I thought we were close, but you know, oftentimes when nobody tells you who they're talking to is often because they're doing something they ain't supposed to be doing. And with people, they know they ain't got no business doing with. Because when, you know, you walk through, y'all already know what, listen, I, I've been here three times. It's been here literally three times. I always sit right there and I do what many of y'all do. When nobody really comes through that side, oh well, duh, because there's stairs right there. Uh, when somebody comes in, I'm just looking, who that? Be because I, I want to know, one, I have friends who say they were coming, but I, you know, I'm trying to look like, okay, who's that? Oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, okay, yeah, man, I haven't seen them in a while. The point is, when the, the people of God are supposed to say, hey, we got eyes on you. Because when you come in with somebody new, somebody's supposed to be, hey, girl, who that? <laughs> you, first of all, you're like, are oh, you real and true? You know, first, I mean, there's ways that can go really crazy. But you know, somebody loves you. If they're not just out here letting you play willy-nilly with, you know, just whoever, but they want to know, yo, who, who's that? Let, let's do a background check. Okay. Let's look at his Instagram. Let's look at his exes. Let's go, let, let's go pull up on, let's, let's, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 I pastor a church in A-Leaf in Southwest Houston. Sometimes, that's what, that, that, so, sometimes, sometimes we got to pull up on people just to be like, hey, bro, what's good? The, the, the point is, if, if, ain't nobody, if ain't nobody checking for you, that's a problem. Because then, the, the, and it's not to be intrusive, man. Listen, we want this to go to distance. It's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. The point is that we want, hey, I want this thing to go the distance. So I, I need people praying. Listen, hey, we finna go watch Spider-Man 3. Uh, you know, the movie is dark. It's the same place we be having church on Sunday. And, you know, we ain't got no plans after the movie. So at 1030, when you know the movie's over, call me. That, like, hey, uh, man, I'm, I'm really praying this is it. And I really need y'all just, hey, talk to him. Hey, Pastor Dio, you know, this is the guy I'm talking to. Hey, Sister Dupe, can you talk to this, you know, so-so? You know, she looked good from a distance, but I don't really know her situation. You, um, let, me, let me do my scouting report. Let me talk to somebody. Like, it, it's the point of that it's a communal endeavor. They say, uh, who's, like, it, they are, it's interesting, the father's not really mentioned because ideally it would be the father who says for their daughter, yo, uh, when my daughter is being spoken of, I, I need to know who, who's coming to the door. But the picture I think it's trying to paint is it's a community project. It doesn't mean that we overstep our boundaries. We understand, listen, you go, at the end, I tell my friends all the time, like, bro, you gonna, you gonna do what you gonna do. I already know that. But if, as your friend, if someone who you've let to have access into your life, can I at least speak into some things? And it's like, man, why you always got an overnight bag? Oh. Listen, I, hey, I already listened to Dial's first sermon, and the so I already know he's been there. So yo, don't even look at me funny. But it's like, what, what, are we, what are we doing? And oftentimes in the church, we got to be careful because it's like, well, you know, God, <laughs> you let me slide. I'm, I'm going to church. I'm giving. I'm tired. I'm praying. I, and it's like, let me slide on this one, though. You know I got needs. And God's like, my son had needs, but he, he still went to that cross, though. I, I, vaguely, I vaguely remember a prayer that says something along the lines of, Lord, let this cup pass. I, I remember vaguely drops of blood as he was praying. I remember him saying, Lord, listen, if there's a plan B, if there's another option for the groom to go and secure the bride, a.k.a. the church, let it be. But he, didn't, he ends up going on the cross, being hung like a human pinata in between two real thieves. And what's, what ends up happening? He says, I, I have these, but my father's needs outweigh them. Be, because love isn't just about how I feel. It's about obeying God. But also, this points to not just those who are single and thinking about relationships, I mean, also for those who are married. I remember I was, a, 
I was interning at an oil company back in college, and my boss, you know, uh, at that time, I thought I was still going to be doing oil and gas, but thank God I made that. That summer, actually, I made a decision, this ain't, this ain't for me. But my boss, I wanted to really, you know, like, get in good with him, and he was like, hey, I, you know, I'm doing some other stuff. Come with me to lunch. You know, you ride with me. We're going downtown to the Federal Reserve. I said, okay, cool. Fed, you know, my man, I'm thinking the Federal Reserve, that's where all the money's at. So, you know, <laughs> you, you must be the plug. We're driving. And the office is on San Felipe, so we're already close. We're driving, and I'm like, why are we going this long way? And then he, lit, I'll never forget, he said, yeah, this is where the eye candy is. And I'm, think, I'm looking at him like, bro, you got a wedding ring? I said, yeah, I made a mental note, never asking that guy for marital advice. Because you don't, you don't, treasure, you don't treasure what you have. You, you don't value what you have. And it speaks to the, if you're married, you need, listen, you need other couples in your life who actually care about marriage. I, I know that we live in a culture where marriage is really like, eh, you can get to it when you want to get to it, or not at all. You can still enjoy the benefits of sex. And Listen, the picture that the Bible paints is that this is a union that Christ died for. Like, when you read Ephesians 5, which you guys already went through in, in the Married in Houston series, he says, oh, husband's love for his wife. And then he says it represents Christ's love for the church. You're like, wait a minute, what is it the marriage union, or is it what Jesus loves for the church? And the answer is yes. It's both in. That when you have other people like, hey, man, listen, I know what it's like. You got small kids and you're still trying to find time for your wife. Look, hey, bring, bring the kids over to the house. Let us watch them so you guys can have a weekend. Like, when, when you got people in your church that say, hey, I, I know you guys are tired. Let me just hold your baby so you and your husband can just, just enjoy sitting next to each other and just hold hands for a little bit. Like, when you have people who are making, de those are small deposits, but what you're communicating is, we want to protect this. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was talking to a friend and he said, hey, man, um, he was kind of talking about the fact that um, work has been really getting crazy and he's really advanced. He's actually he's running the company. And he said, man, Io, um, the reality is, I'm, like I, I was burnt out six months ago. And, but you know, he's gotten raised after raise really quickly. And, I, and he said, man, my wife, this ain't gonna last long. And I'm telling him, hey man, this is what we need to do. You know, you need to prioritize your family, da 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 da. And he ends up saying, he said, man, that sounds like a lot of work. I said, well. Let me tell you what's going to be a lot of work. Uh, calling all these divorce lawyers, trying to figure out who gets which kid on the weekend, uh, hoping that your ex doesn't remarry then somebody better than you and your daughter wants him to walk her down the aisle. Let, whatever, whatever work you think it's going to cost you now, it'll be infinitely more work on the long end if you don't protect it. If you don't protect it. And that's actually, we don't, we don't even have to look too far because it actually gives us two examples of protection. He, one, he references Solomon. He says, Solomon has a vineyard at Baal Haman, and he let out all the vineyards. Vineyard there is talking about a, a woman and, you know, sexual intimacy with a woman. The point that he's trying to make there is um, it's referencing 1 Kings 11.3 where it says Solomon has 700 wives and 300 concubines. And because that's a thousand. And, he ends up, and she ends up saying that they will pay you a thousand pieces of silver. What she's really saying is that, Solomon, you got all these women in your harem. You're looking for this love, and you're trying to find it in sex, and it hasn't satisfied you. I have one vineyard, and I'm satisfied. Those are big. Like, if, I know Pastor Dyer has already mentioned this, but the point of Solomon, Solomon isn't trying to point to the fact, man, Solomon is a great husband and leader, and he's, no, the point is that brother is jacked up, and it's pointing to a greater king, Someone who perfectly loves his bride. Someone who sacrifices for her even when she goes the other way. Someone who pursues her even when she's not pursuing him. The great love of Christ for his church. And she says, I am, I'm, I'm protecting what I, hey, listen, you may have people coming in and out. You have to hire out people to care for your vineyards. My beloved is mine. I may not have all the, I may not be a playboy like you, Solomon, but I'm secure because my love is protected. The first, we've seen just the, the joy of sexual union in the marriage relationship as uh, the first few verses um, reference the, um, the power of love. And then we've seen also um, just the reality and the importance of protecting it, which I think is really important in the day and age we live in today because it seems like nobody wants to protect anything but themselves. And the Bible saying, man, protect your sexual intimacy. Don't be generous with it. Be guarded with it. And if it's a struggle, even in a marriage relationship where you have 
nightmares from your past that you're like, dang, I wish that wasn't on my track record. You need the gospel's help in real time in your marriage to work in and through it because he's able and he's willing to do it. But then finally, the promise of love. He says this in verses 13 through 14. All, O you who dwell in the gardens with the companions listening to your voice, let me hear it. It's the man talking. He wants to hear his beloved. He says, make haste, my beloved. Be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. When people are like, man, the Bible's so, you know, it's outdated. I'm like, would you ever consider that a book in the Bible would end with someone asking for sex? She says, now, she says, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. Make haste, my beloved. She's, she's, she's begging, come back. It leaves on this huge cliffhanger. One commentator says it like this, it honestly seems like an odd way to end a poem. We might expect that the conclusion would bring complete and unbreakable intimacy. Perhaps, however, this better explains love in the real world. We yearn and hope and occasionally get glimpses of a deep and satisfying relationship, but complete union is reserved, not for this world, but for the world to come. It's begging us for more. Is that sex is not the end all be all. It's the bridegroom saying, I wanna hear from my bride. And it's the, the bride saying, I, wanna, I want you to come back to me. It, the Song of Solomon ends the very same way the Bible ends. In Revelation 22, verse 17, the bridegroom says this, Surely I am coming soon, followed by a passionate plea from the bride. Or excuse me, from yeah, the bride. The first one was from the Lord Jesus. The second is from the bride. It says, come, Lord Jesus. Maranetha, come. It's, whether single or married, every single last one of us have a deep desire in our hearts for a longing that, that, sex, goes, that sex can never satisfy a longing for the bride, the church, to be wedded and to embrace its great lover. The, when you think about Jesus' life, it is a model for what it looks like to keep trusting God even when you're waiting on a desire that hasn't fully experienced, you haven't fully experienced it. He comes down from heaven to earth for his bride, and yet he goes straight to work, which, by the way, in Genesis 2, God gives Adam his job in the garden before he gives him his wife. And I always tell people all the time, like, listen, you ain't, you ain't got to be Jeff, Bezo, Jeff Bezos, but before you need a wife, you need a job. That's, a, that's, a second, that's just a side note for another day. But Jesus, he goes straight to it. He's on his mission. He is pursuing his bride. He is healing people. He is on mission. He is caring for those that, that the Lord has called him to. And, and they don't want him, but yet he's still going after them to the point that he says, I will sacrifice myself on your behalf because you don't understand what love looks like. You think love needs to be curated. You think love needs to be filtered. Love, when you look at the cross, is grimy. It includes pain. It includes loss but it has a future and a hope that is far greater than anything you can experience in this world. I think for married people, we have to be careful in making marriage be like, this is heaven, it's not. It's a joy, and man, I got two younger sisters sometimes, I mentioned it and I talk about the time, like dang, it's hard in these streets. I'm, I'm glad that I'm not on hinge and on these dating apps right now. But yet, the reality is that even the marriage relationship that I have, it won't last forever. That the Bible has this picture in Matthew, in Matthew's gospel that in heaven says that they won't be giving away or taking in marriage. Why? Because you'll finally be united with your groom, the Lord Jesus. And if you're single, it means that, one, you are pursuing the Lord Jesus with all that you have. Doug O'Donnell has a great line where he says that what the Song of Solomon teaches us is that patience and purity comes before passion and pleasure. Patience and purity comes before passion and pleasure. I'm not even going to lie. I, I know the hard part is the patience, especially when you feel like, God, I'm doing all that you've asked me to do. I'm waiting, Lord, like I'm not out here in these streets. Like I'm really, I, I really want you and I really desire this good thing. I know sex is a good thing that you created in the marriage covenant. And God says, trust me. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not even going to try to like bamboozle you. I don't know how it will play out for you. Man, we have a, like, I look at our church sometimes, we have a lot of single women, and I'm, and I'm like, Lord, and I, you know, I'm the kind of pastor, I'm praying for these women by name. Like, Lord, please let them find a godly man who loves you more than they love them, because that's how they'll know he's the right one, like all these things. But I also have to say, Lord, give them a deep desire for you that far outweighs, far surpasses anything this world has to offer, so that they don't feel like at the end of their life, if they don't get what they want, that you bamboozle them. 
because the hope of the gospel was never the fact that God gave you everything you wanted. It was the fact that God gave you himself. And that has to be enough. It has to be enough. It pushes us beyond this world into the world to come. And it allows us to actually be the church, which means that it, married people, we're not just only trying to hang out with our married friends. Like, it's crazy to me when I officiate a wedding and all of a sudden, like, the whole the married couple, they got a whole new friend group. I'm like, wait a minute. When you were engaged and single, you was trying to come to my house with me and my wife and eat dinner with us. You were trying to, oh, let me watch your kids. Oh, what, what is that picture? Like, we, we invited you in because we understood you need family, not just marriage. And then when you get to the other side of the altar, you're like, oh, I'm good. I got what I wanted. No, 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 that's not the way it works. Your home is a hospitality. It's used for God's people. It's used to be in community with people and not just feel like, hey, I got what I wanted. I'm good. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, Lord, I'm a part of a family. And even my marriage, as great as it may be, will not last past death because I have a greater groom awaiting me. Family, when we take this and we, it becomes not just theoretical, but it becomes something that we harness, we keep love. Everybody, you know, I talk to people all the time. It's like, oh, how do I keep my life in balance? Life's never in balance. It's in dynamic tension. When we keep things in dynamic tension, where you can say, Lord, I really desire this, but I understand I'm not there, so I don't want to be like Solomon, looking for love in all the wrong places, saying, God, you know, I gave you five years, I gave you six years, you didn't do it on your timeline, so I'm going to just go out here and soil my oats and enjoy living in the city and doing all these things, even though I know it's going to cause me heartache and pain on the last thing because I'm having temporary people do permanent things. You hold in that tension, you say, Lord, I'm holding on to you. I'm holding on to you because you are enough. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray, God, that your word would be a light unto our path and a light unto our feet. We ask that you would deepen our affection and our commitment to you. Lord, for those who are married, Lord, may their joy in sexual union grow more and more, and not just the sex, but the emotional and the relational, and Lord, just the spiritual climate in their home get better and better. Lord, and for those who are single, Father, would you place in them a desire for you that's so deep that you would carry them through every season. And by your grace, we're asking, and I'm praying specifically, Lord, that that would move into something being realized. That they would experience the joy, knowing, God, that even if, even if they experience it, it's still pointing to something far greater. Help us to be people who are hungry and humble and dependent on you. In Christ's name, amen. Just worship God and respond to what we've heard this morning. Mm -hmm. I just want to be where you are I just want to be near your heart There is nothing like your love Ooh. There is nothing like your love I just want to be I just want to be where you
Father, we, we need you. We need the potency of the gospel to inflame our hearts so that it beats for you. God, we need the protection of your love the same way that the woman wants her love to be a seal on the man's arm. You have sealed us with your spirit and we pray, God, that the fact that we know we are yours would bring us comfort and peace and hope and even in our difficult circumstances. We pray that the promise of love that you give us, knowing that you will come again, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come quickly, that we would be a people who are always looking for your return because we know that what we see here is not what will always be, but that our hearts are united by faith, trusting that as you have saved us and sanctified us and justified us and cleansed us, you will once again come back for us, Lord, that the love that you have for us that death can't stop it, the grave can't stop it, that you resurrected victoriously, communicating to the world, my love never fails. May all of us, whether single or married, be transformed by that love, and may we share it to see it transform others. In Christ's name, amen.